This time on Project House, we traveled to Palermo, Maine to learn how to build a bookshelf fireplace surround with job site carpentry tools. Over the years, we've worked with a lot of talented designers and really excellent builders, but it's rare to find somebody like Mike Maines, who's so good at both things. And that's why we came to Palermo, Maine, for him to show us a little bit about how to design and build a fireplace surround all on site. <laughs> Mike, been a long time. This is a new house for you and your wife. It is a new house for us. It's, it's, it was built in 1830s. It's a Greek revival style. We're renovating it uh, to make it livable be, before we move in in a few months. Mike designed the new surround to mesh with the Greek revival style of the existing house. He wanted to be respectful of the home's history, but also give the new built-ins an updated, slightly modern feel. Before we arrived, he installed slate tile around the existing firebox in preparation for the cabinetry. The design consists of a mantel shelf set on pilasters, flanked by a pair of bookcases with solid wood backs and paneled doors in the lower half. A matching overmantel fills the space above the firebox, and simple baseboard and crown molding tie the whole design together. And the plan is to build it all here, on site, with job site tools most carpenters already own. So how did you get to work building them on site? I wanted to build cabinets and install cabinets. I couldn't afford a dedicated shop space, so I just sort of adapted the job site carpentry tools so I could set up a shop in a garage, in a living room, in a driveway. And do you feel like you're sacrificing anything by doing it on site? I think I can build cabinets that are 95% as good as anything shop made on a job site with relatively inexpensive job site tools. When it comes to setting up shop, Mike is very particular. He sets up the saws and work table to create a U-shaped walking space that not only allows ease of movement between workstations, but also lets two people work without feeling crowded. We are all set up and ready to rock. Mike, I hope you don't mind I brought a couple of my own tools. That's good. Okay, so where are we starting? Uh, we're going to start with roughing out stock for face frames. Looks like we're going to use poplar for face frames. Yeah, this is yellow poplar. Uh, these are one by sixes. It's a pretty clear, flat grain, paints well. Sounds like a plan. Let me grab my cut list and we'll just start laying things out. Okay. To make money, you need to be fast. So rather than building the cabinet boxes first and then having to work around them while cutting and assembling the face frame, Mike builds his face frames first. To begin, we work from Mike's cut list, which is a formatted and streamlined tally that he types up based on the drawing. It's the best cut list I've ever seen on any job site because it matches the actual workflow. To make efficient use of materials, the list is organized from top to bottom based on size. The biggest pieces are at the top and the smallest at the bottom. And from left to right, it always goes in the same order. And this matches the actual sequence of operations used to prepare each piece. In the far right column, he has a box for each component in the group. After a piece is roughed out, he makes a hash mark through the matching box. Later, when that piece is cut to final length, a second hash mark finishes the X. This way, you can look at the list and know, at a glance, which parts are done and ready to go. Here's the milling process for the face frames. Measure and mark the solid stock to rough length. An inch or so beyond the final measurement is more than enough. And always write the dimensions of the final piece on the show side of each board. Then, cut the rough lengths on the miter saw and group the pieces based on their final widths so that they can be ripped on the table saw moving the fence as few times as possible. The rough rip cuts should leave the pieces within a quarter inch to an eighth inch of their final width. Then you run through the thickness planer to finish the job, and then cut everything to the final length in the miter saw. Well, Mike just finished cutting the face frame pieces to the final length. But before we move on to the joinery, can you give us just a quick lesson about what we're looking at here? So this is the face frame that we just milled. In filling between the styles, we have the horizontal rails. So then those are all cut to length now. The next step is to lay these out and then make the joints from styles to rails. Okay, so what are we using to make that joint? Uh, we're going to use pocket screws. All right, cool. So we're just going to lay these uh, rails out and I mark them with a triangle marking system. It's really simple. We'll just do this and mark the number of the cabinet. In this case, it's cabinet one. And then once it's separated, um, you always know which, which board goes where. Okay. On the back side, I'm just simply gonna put a P. Oh, P for so, pocket screws, no confusion. Pretty pretty simple. So I guess you've put the holes in the wrong side of the face frame a couple of times? Once, maybe it might have happened. <laughs> 
While Mike finishes marking out the pieces, he has me drill pocket holes in the back sides of each rail. The hidden pocket screws are fast and simple, a real time saver. And I like to use just a little bit of glue. Glue your end grain, huh? I, I, I like a little glue on the end grain. Even at one-tenth the strength of edge grain gluing, Mike likes to apply glue to the end grain of his face frame joinery because he believes it contributes to keeping the joint tight and prevents it from telegraphing through the paint. All I know is if it's good enough for Mike Maines, it's good enough for me. So we continue to add a dab of carpenter's glue, clamp them tight, and screw them together to complete the two face frames for these bookcases. All right, that's it. All right, let's just flip this over and we'll uh, give it a quick sanding. Another great breakthrough for job site shops is the dust collection technology. With a proper setup and the right tools, you can opt out of using a dust mask or respirator when the vacuum is on, even in a small indoor space like this. Well, with face frames complete, our first day in Palermo, Maine comes to an end. Next up, we'll learn how Mike tackles site-built cabinet boxes. From breaking down sheet goods accurately, to tacking the boxes together with finish nails, attaching the face frames, and banging the box into true.